Hello and welcome back to the channel where you watch an LSD hallucination of a bad drawing of a rat talk about how that goofy pirate manga is actually based on a ridiculous amount of complicated real world mythology. So in my last video I predicted that Carrot would be getting the Toa Tonomi, a yet unintroduced devil fruit and joining the Straw Hats. If you want to see how I originally arrived at this fruit, you can watch that video and some things will make slightly more sense if you do, but it's not a requirement to watch this one. But what if I told you that it goes much deeper than just a power up for Carrot? That this fruit holds the answer for not only all of the setup we have gotten for Carrot thus far and where all this taking her character, but to what Sunisha's crime was, what the Dukes and Momonosuke's roles are in bringing the Dawn of the World, and is the key to understand what the Dawn of the World even is, Imu's intentions and why Imu created the world government in the first place. If this at all sounds interesting to you, even if just to laugh at how crazy this guy on YouTube is, well, grab yourself a snack, because this rabbit hole goes deep, all the way down to the core of the One Piece world. I'm Gabiru, and this is the Twilight Bunny Theory. So to start off, what even is the Toa Toonomi? Toa means eternity, permanence, perpetuity, or immortality. Thus, the one who eats it would be a Toa Ningen, an immortal person. The first thing is the fruit grants you immortality, it makes you eternal, unaging. But the Toa Toonomi is also the counterpart to the Toki Tokinomi. If the Toki Tokinomi is the foreign march of time, the Toa Toonomi is permanence, stasis. If the power of the Toki Tokinomi is to leap forward in time, then the power of the Toa Toonomi is to remain stationary in time, to stop time itself. So other than immortality, the fruit should grant the user abilities related to stopping time. But why I even believe that this fruit exists? Well, in this very arc of Wano is when we were introduced to the Toki Tokinomi. Just like the Toki Tokinomi is heavily tied to Wano and the Kozuki, it makes sense that its counterpart, the sun to its moon or vice versa, would be heavily tied to the minx. There are many other reasons why we should believe this, one of which is Zunisha and Salvador Dali. Zunisha is based on the long-legged elephants from the paintings of surrealist artist Salvador Dali. Zunisha's species is called Naitamie Norida, which read backwards is Dari no Emitaina, meaning looks like Dari. But Dali's most famous painting is actually not of elephants at all. It's this one, The Persistence of Memory, a painting of melting clocks. Doesn't just make perfect sense for the ability to stop time, that is to break or to melt the clock just like in Dali's painting, to be with Dali's elephant. But why Carrot? Many reasons. First of all, Alice in Wonderland. Whole Cake Island arc, and especially Carrot's part in it, is largely inspired by Alice's adventure in Wonderland. Alice's adventure starts with a young and naive Alice uninvitedly following the white rabbit who was heading to a tea party into the Wonderland, a fantastical yet somewhat unsettling place. Whole Cake Island starts with a young and naive carrot uninvitedly following the Straw Hats as they head towards Big Moon's Tea Party in Totoland, a fantastical yet unsettling place. Carrot is not only based on Alice herself, but also on the one Alice follows into the Wonderland, the white rabbit who looks at his clock worried about being late to the tea party. Big Mom is inspired by the Queen of Hearts, sharing her tendency for executing people over the smallest offenses and for beheading. <gasps> Whole Cake Island even draws inspiration from the sequel to Alice in Wonderland, Through the Looking Glass, where Alice enters a mirror into an inverted mirror world. Not by coincidence, Carrot is the first one we see enter Brulé's mirror world. Alice in Wonderland was likely a big inspiration for Oda in general. The White Rabbit's feature looking at his clock in the altar's notes for literally the second volume ever of One Piece. The thing is, Alice's adventure in Wonderland is filled with themes of manipulating and especially stopping time. In Through the Looking Glass, time is sometimes stopped or runs backwards, and in the original book, the Hatter and the March Hare are always having tea because the Hatter supposedly murdered the time when he tried to sing for the Queen of Hearts, leading time to halt himself as punishment, keeping the Hatter eternally stuck at tea time. And when you think about it, what is the one ability that the White Rabbit who looks at his clock worried about being late would want above any other? Of course, the ability to stop time. We cannot talk about immortality in an East Asian work of fiction without talking about the Senin, in Chinese Xiang, the immortals from Taoist mythology. The Senin are supposedly immortal and enlightened beings. 
the other most common traits associated to descending are the ability to fly and living in extremely high places. The ideogram for Xi'an being composed of person and mountain. As you see further in this video, there is a big focus on foreshadowing surrounding Carrot on the fact that she can fly. The concept of descending was even mentioned in One Piece already. It is described by Kumadori back in Enya's lobby when he talks about Seimei Kikan. Among the three most important texts in Taoism, both the Zhuangzi and the Lietzi have descriptions of these immortals. In the Zhuangzi, an immortal is also described as having skin white like snow or ice and being gentle and shy like a young girl. Kert also has fur, white like snow or ice, and the personality of a young girl. In the Lietze, there is a detailed description of five absurdly high peaks, on top of which Senning are said to reside, the most famous of these being Mount Penglai, where the elixir of immortality is fable to grow. There were even real-life expeditions sent by the Chinese emperor to find Mount Penglai and this plant of immortality. I'll read you some of the description to this place uh, and show you some images and you see if it rings any bells for you. The Lietze states that on these mountains, the towers and terraces upon them are all gold and jade. The beasts and birds are all unsullied white. Trees of pearl and garnet always grow densely, flowering and bearing fruit, which is always luscious. And those who eat of it never grow old and die. If there's any parallel in the One Piece world to the Five Peaks, it's so. Zo is literally 25,000 meters above sea level, 15,000 meters higher than goddamn Skypiea. It's probably the most high up location in the world other than the moon itself. The five peaks residing atop giant turtles is similar to the Hindu myth where the world rests on the back of giant elephants, those being themselves atop even larger turtles. This myth was likely an inspiration for Zunisha. There's even a tale in the Lietze in which a giant from the kingdom of the dragon Earl attacks some of the turtles that carry the mountains on their back. Kind of similar to how Jack, a gigantic man from the beast kingdom of the dragon Kaido, attacks Zunisha. No, the land of immortals being atop Zunisha is also fitting given Zunisha is the oldest living creature in One Piece thus far, being over a thousand years old. So if you watch Yudan on YouTube or you watch Ohara's theory video on Imu, you know about banana type myths and their importance in the One Piece story. Banana type myths are a type of myth in which the banana represents mortality, finiteness or short-lived, and the stone represents immortality, eternity or long life. Chapter 877, which has the wordplay banana, is when Pedro, the mink colored like a rotting banana, and who was essentially fastly rotting away by having had 50 years of his lifespan stolen by Big Mom, dies at the young age of 32. If Pedro is the banana, then who is the stone? Well, of course, it's his disciple, the one he talks to right before dying and tells to keep moving forward. Finally, Pedro means rock, while Carrot is the one named after a perishable vegetable. And just like Pedro is partially based on a banana, Carrot is also partially based on a rock. That rock being the moon itself. Because you see, Carrot is based on the myth of the moon rabbit. The moon rabbit is an East Asian myth about the rabbit residing on the moon. This is born out of people associating this shape of the moon to the figure of a rabbit. In the Japanese version of the myth, the rabbit pounds mochi on the moon. This is why Luffy pounds the mochi in Whole Cake Island when Carrot is traveling with him for the first time. But in the Chinese version of the myth, rather than mochi, the rabbit pounds the elixir of immortality. So here's the tale of how the rabbit ends up on the moon. A monkey, a fox and a rabbit are begged for food by a starving old man. The monkey gathers fruits from the trees, the fox gathers fish from the river, but the rabbit, unable to gather anything but grass, asks the beggar to build a fire and then throws itself into the flames, offering its own body for the beggar to eat. The beggar then reveals himself to be a deity. In the original Buddhist version, Sakra, the ruler of the heavens, in other versions, the Jade Emperor, seeking an animal noble enough to be entrusted with pounding the elixir of immortality, or the old man on the moon. The deity then saves the rabbit from the flames and touched by its extreme kindness and selflessness, takes the rabbit to live with him on the moon. Now with Pedro dead, the minx closest to Carrot, the rabbit, are Bariat, the monkey, and Wanda, the fox. And we see the rabbit being unable to gather anything but grass, being referenced by Perosperos telling Carrot that she is good for nothing but eating grass. Like the rabbit on the tail, Carrot will be chosen to inherit the elixir of immortality, the Toatonomi, after performing an ultimate act of self-sacrifice, likely by jumping into flames. Have you seen memes like this? 
While they're pretty funny, there might be something to this Carrot vs Yamato being just Zoro vs Sanji than just a joke. See, Yamato shares many similarities with Zoro, and likewise, there are a lot of similarities between Carrot and Sanji. Both focus on agility and have powerful legs, share the theme of observation, use Skywalk, fight extremely close range, both are blonde, make use of sabotage, and their main trait is their kindness, and Carrot's mentor Pedro is even made to be somewhat similar to Sanji with the smoking and covering one eye. So I say all of this because Sanji got a Super Sentai theme recently. What is a grow version of Super Sentai? It would be the Maho Shoujo or Magical Grow genre that brought the transforming hero elements of Super Sentai to the young women audience. Specifically, those elements were brought to the genre by Sailor Moon, the most iconic shoujo manga and anime of all time. Finally, Sailor Moon is also based on the Moon Rabbit. Her civilian name is Tsuki no Uzaki, literally meaning Rabbit of the Moon. Sailor Moon was also blonde and had a form with moon white hair, Princess Serenity and Neo Queen Serenity. When Kert goes so long for the first time, we see very prominently the number 28. Chapter 28 is called Crescent Moon, which is Sailor Moon symbol. The original Sailor Moon manga ran from 1991 to February 1997, the same year One Piece began serialization and might have inspired One Piece in ways you wouldn't expect. In the Sailor Moon universe, there used to be an ancient, extremely technologically advanced civilization on the moon that fell to ruin in a distant past. This seem familiar? So I mention this because Eternal Youth is a staple in the genre. Sailor Moon and the other Guardians, for example, stopped aging at 22 and would live with youthful appearances for over 10 centuries. And also, stopping time is a pretty magical grow like ability, isn't it? It's also a staple in the genre. It's in Sailor Moon through Sailor Pluto, it's in Card Captor Sakura, and is extremely central to the most critically acclaimed magical grow show, Madoka Magica. This is part of the reason why Carrot was made so young. 15. Because more than that, and we're getting out of the age range for magical girls. It's also why Carrot's drawings are like something out of a shoujo manga, because she basically is a character from one. But maybe you're thinking, would Oda really add a magical girl into One Piece? Let me answer this with another question. What do you think is the anime Oda sees as One Piece's rival? Maybe one of the old big three? Maybe a more recent show like Attack on Titan or Demon Slayer? Maybe Dragon Ball as in trying to surpass her predecessor? No, as a matter of fact, it is pretty cure, a magical girl show. The reason? Girls, specifically his daughters, prefer to watch it over One Piece. Oda is gonna use Carrot to get his daughters to watch One Piece and to tell Pretty Cure, anything you can do, I can do better. The chapter Carrot goes so long for the first time is 888, in volume 88. That chapter is portrayed as the most important one in that volume, both receiving the same name and the volume cover being themed around it. Lots of eights, isn't it? So if you go to volume 8, and yes, I said volume 8, when Luffy was fighting freaking Don Creek. The author's note is this, talking about an obscure tale about rabbits flying in the past. Flying rabbits, huh? It also talks about how in Japanese, you count rabbits the same way you count birds, using the suffix wa, ichiwa, niwa, sanwa, and if you count up to 10, you would have juwa or towa. Kinda interesting that Carrot would be the 10th recruit, no? In the cover for that volume, we see Don Krieg wearing a shirt with a leopard or jaguar print, and the effigy of Krieg's ship is a big cat with a large scar across its left eye. Seems familiar? The Jolly Roger of the Krieg Pirates has two hourglasses in it, supposedly meant to tell their enemies that their time is over. A timekeeping device and running out of time, huh? The title of volume 8 is I Won't Die, Immortality. So if you go to chapter 8, and yes, I say chapter 8, when Nami was first introduced, you get this shot of Buggy's ship with its elephant effigy. Buggy's crew largely dressed like animals because of the circus theme, so the ship is an elephant that carries animal people on its back. Sounds familiar? Then immediately after, you get this shot of a water fountain with a whale statue in the middle. When Luffy first arrives in Zoe and we see the whale tree for the first time, it's aligned with the water filtration structure that receives rain eruptions and funnels the water into canals, mirroring the water fountain from Water 7, making it look like the water fountain in Chapter 8. 
In fact, this is usually how the whale tree is shown to us. Why is the whale tree compared to a fountain? Because in it is where the toatonomy will be. The whale tree is the fountain of youth. The very next chapter begins volume 2, which opens up with that author's note with the white rabbit from Alice in Wonderland. So what's the deal with carrot and the number 8? The answer is in this color spread. In it, the Straw Hats are fixing a broken clock, and in the forefront we see Chopper with an 8 in his shirt and holding the number 8 sideways, making it look like the symbol for infinity. This is the meaning of the spread. If the forward march of time is finiteness, then the broken clock represents eternity or infinity, infinite time. Carrot is associated with the number 8 because of infinity, eternity. Now does it sound ludicrous to you that there will be foreshadowing for this since the very beginning of One Piece? Well, let's take a look at some more of the foreshadowing for Carrot's mere existence going hundreds of chapters back. In Drum Island, when we recruit Chopper, who Carrot calls as her older brother, we have the Lapunts, snow rabbits that fight with their claws and are even described as almost flying. They look familiar to you, by the way? Color spread for chapter 175, Luffy and Nami in front of a big ass jaguar wearing a bizarre white rabbit hat. A jaguar and a white rabbit, you say? Gombe from Mother 7, Chimney's rabbit who behaves like a cat. Have you noticed characters that fight with claw gloves like Carrot are usually cats and come in duos? Kinda like Carrot is almost like two different characters in one? I was playing this weirdness with cats and rabbits for your own. This guy from Great Terminal in Luffy's post-war flashback holding a doll that looks exactly like Carrot. The snow rabbit things we see under the sun in chapter 700, leading people to believe Molest Fruit respawned in one of Nami's tangerines and would be eaten by Carrot. But what if the only foreshadowing here is that a white snow rabbit would be bored in the sunny? But actually this is just the tip of the iceberg for weird foreshadowing for Carrot. And now maybe you're wondering, why? Why is there this much foreshadowing for her? I mean, is Carrot really this important of a character? The theme of night and day, moon and sun, has been played up heavily in One Piece, but it went through the roof with Zou and the Minx. The Minx divide themselves between those serving Inuarashi, ruler of the day, and Nekomomushi, ruler of the night. And they are divided as such to the point that they sleep at opposite times so that Inu and Neko, sun and moon, never meet, lest they start fighting. Only a few Minx can break this rule and walk between day and night, the King's Bird, one of whom is Scarret. But for Carrot, this theme goes much deeper. Carrot is part of the Inuarashi Musketeer Squad, but her mentor is Pedro, the captain of Nekomomushi's Guardians. And rather than the blue cape of the Musketeers, she wears the green cape of the Guardians, being the only mink to break this uniform code. In the cover of Volume 81, we see the Guardians on the left side and the Musketeers on the right side. Except for Carrot, who is a Musketeer yet is on the left side amongst the Guardians. Pedro, her mentor and the one she inherits her will from, was the captain of the Nox Bards. Nox being knight in Latin, named as such according to Pedro because they are the ones before the dawn, the ones laying the foundation for it. Pedro realizes that the Straw Hats are the ones to usher in the dawn, and tells Carrot this. If Pedro was captain of the Night Pirates, the Straw Hats are essentially the Day Pirates. Their ship is the Thousand Sunny, their captain is the Sun God, Luffy's hat is the sun rising above the horizon, you get it. And by being mentored by Pedro from the Night Pirates and then joining the Straw Hats, the Pirates of the Day, again, Carrot connects night and day. Unlike all the other minks, who are either in day or in night, Carrot is in between. She is in Twilight, the connection between day and night. But what does this have to do with the Toa Toa? Anyone speculating about Carrot getting a Devil Fruit must consider this. Does the Devil Fruit allow her to use Sulong even if there is no moonlight? Having a powered up form, especially one with so much thought and personality poured into it, be something available only certain days of the month, at night, and if the weather behaves, is just too inconvenient for a regular member of the crew. Is she a part of the crew? Are the Straw Hats gonna plan raids only if they have the full moonlight so she can be at full strength? Or is Oda gonna conveniently ride in the full moon whenever she is in need? No, she has to be able to use this without all of these external conditions. And the need for this is made explicit in her fight against Prosperous, in which she loses because the clouds cover the moon. The most popular theory for her devil fruit used to be Mone's Yuki Yuki no Mi, but unless Oda pulls some BS with her making a moon made out of snow, it doesn't make her able to use Solon on the regular. But would the Toa Toa no Mi, a permanence or eternity fruit, do? Yes, in quite a straightforward way, in fact. She could make the effects of the moonlight on her permanent. Either she can switch between this permanent moonlight effect 
on and off, maybe switching to a permanent sunlight effect or such, or she could improve her control over the Solung form to the point where she can go out of the form at will, even under the effect of the moonlight, so she can be permanently under the moon's effect. All depends on how Oda chooses to write this fruits ability. It's also noteworthy that traditionally East Asian calendars, such as the old Japanese calendars, were lunar calendars, based on the phase of the moon. To this day, the word in Japanese for month is the same word for moon, tsuki. This month is essentially this moon. The flow of time is inextricably tied to the phases of the moon. We see this in Thomas powers, for example, that run over exactly after one lunar cycle. So to defy the phases of the moon by using Sulong at any time is thematically equivalent to defying time itself. It's important to note that Carrot's Sulong form is not just a powered up form. It's basically her alter ego, almost a different character. Her regular form is cheery, goofy, naive, easily excitable, bright as the sun. Her Solon form is calm, stoic, confident, teasing, mocking, cool as the moon. Her character design reflects this. Her hair is normally yellow like the sun and turns white like the moon when she transforms. If she gains the ability to transform back and forth from Solon at will, it will complete her theme of being between day and night and crossing freely between the two. It's also good material for gags and fun characters interactions since she will be kind of bipolar, you know, one moment she's a regular goofy carrot, the next she's cool Sulong carrot. And since she would be the lookout, it would be fitting that she, as the one who will be at the highest point atop the sunny, will at some times be the sun and at others be the moon. And even more fitting for the whimsical straw hats that whether she's the sun or the moon has no relation to what time of day it is. If base form represents the sun and the day, and Sulong represents the moon and the night, then the mink who can cross freely between the two at any time is the one who, unlike the other minks who are either day or night, is perpetually between day and night. That mink is twilight, in Japanese toai raito. And there is even a little wordplay here. If we say carrot is the twilight in Japanese, it would be kyarato wa toai raito desu. Do you see the toa toa in there? Inuarashi and Nekumamushi as ruler of day and ruler of night are the ones who must choose the mink to inherit the Toa autonomy and become twilight. They are the ones who are gonna choose Carrot after she performs that act of self-sacrifice. And this is why Pedro said that they cannot die, that the world awaits them, because twilight is that first light of day that appears right before the sun rises above the horizon. The arrival of twilight marks the coming of the dawn. Now, if you watched my previous video, you would know that I think Oda borrows a lot from Greek mythology. And in Greek mythology, there is one goddess whose function is exactly heralding in the dawn. Eos, the Greek goddess of the dawn, who would every day open the gates of heaven and fly through the sky, heralding in the coming of her brother, the sun god Helios. Eos, other than being described as having rosy arms and rosy fingers, which by the way is maybe why we often see part of Carrot's fur being called rosy, is described as wearing saffron color robes. Now back to the color spread of chapter 692. The world has been put in a stasis by Imu. The clock of the world has been broken. The new day will not arrive. These straw hats are fixing this giant broken clock because they fix the clock of the world by bringing the dawn. Notice how Frank is about to put the zero in 10 and Luffy is holding a bone in place of the one. The only number completely missing from the clock is the number eight, infinity. Once infinity, the toatonomy, is put in its correct place, the clock of the world can start running again. There is a big theme of time and specifically running out of it surrounding the dawn and Pedro's story. The Roger pirates were too early to bring the dawn. When Pedro meets Roger, Pedro can join him as Roger is running out of time. Then when Pedro meets Luffy, it's Pedro himself who is running out of time by being 82 years and spent lifespan. So isn't it interesting that the power of the Toa autonomy is precisely to defy time? If Pedro had inherited the Toa autonomy, the 50 years of his lifespan that were taken would not have mattered. He wouldn't be condemned to a short life. He would have been able to sail with the Pirate King like he dreamed of as a child. And not only would he be able to witness the dawn of the world, he would be the one to bring it. And when you think about it, Pedro is the obvious choice for the one to become a Twilight. He was the captain of the Guardians, together with Shishilin, the highest ranking mink other than the Dukes. He wanted to sail with Roger as a kid and he dedicated his entire life to the dawn of the world. 
And I'm going to say that this is no coincidence, that since Oda likes to stab us in the heart, it's going to be revealed that the Dukes discussed with Pedro the possibility of him becoming Twilight, but he rejected it. Pedro gave up on living a long life and on everything that he dreamed of since he was a child, because he thought Carrot should be the one. And this is why Pedro as the captain of the Nox Pirates is the one who lays the foundation for the Dawn, because he was Carrot's mentor. Now that Carrot is currently likely feeling that she failed Pedro by not being able to avenge him, the big revelation would be that Pedro instead had something astronomically larger in mind for her. Now there are very few things we know about our boy Zunisha. He was Joy Boy's companion, he committed some kind of crime 800 years ago, he is now forced to wander the seas unless ordered waterwise by Momo, and he is over a thousand years old. How much older? Well, likely significantly older, because Zo was built a thousand years ago, thus Zunisha was likely already fully grown a thousand years ago. Zunisha also has the same eyes as Imu, Mihawk and Hakuba. Those eyes, I'm gonna claim, denote someone who is immortal. Imu is pretty obvious. Hakuba seems like some kind of spirit that has possessed Cavendish and could easily be immortal too, having to switch hosts when they grow old. But the greatest hint is Dracul Mihawk, clearly inspired by the vampire Dracula, who was immortal. Now, remember what Don Creek's Jolly Roger represents? The Howard glasses, meaning their opponent has run out of time. So fittingly, he gets wrecked by an immortal man, one whose time will never run out. Just like I claimed last video that Joy Boy's second coming is based on the second coming of Christ and that Kaido as the false Joy Boy represents the Antichrist or Pseudo Christus, the false Christ who appears right before the second coming, Zunisha's punishment is based on the tale of the Wandering Jew. This is a tale popular in medieval Europe about a Jewish man who commits some kind of crime against Jesus as he's carrying the cross. In some versions he hits him, in others just insults him. As punishment, the man is made immortal and forced to wander the earth until the second coming. Just like the wandering Jew, Zunisha's crime is also when he gained immortality. Because the Toa autonomy hasn't just been in Zo, Zunisha ate it and that was his crime. But hasn't Zunisha been aging for those 800 years you ask? Well, has he or has he just been this old the whole time? See, the Toa Tonomi doesn't reverse time or aging, it merely stops it. Zunisha was already old as hell 800 years ago. That's why he ate the Toa Tonomi, because he could not accept his own mortality. But as a result, he doesn't get any younger and is forced to wander the earth for 800 years with his old and frail body. Now only wishing for the rest in death he wants fear. The power he sought turned into a curse, a common theme in stories about immortality. We were told Zunisha is likely not just wandering aimlessly, but looking for a particular place. Zunisha appears for the first time in chapter 795 called Suicide. The same chapter Kaido is introduced. How is he introduced? As a man looking for a place to die. And this is no coincidence, the place Zunisha has been looking forward to is also a place to die. But why was this a crime? Because the fruit was meant for twilight and because of this it's imperative for the dawn of the world that the fruit doesn't fall in the wrong hands, specifically the world government, until Joy Boy reappears. And here's where the stories of the Toatonomi and the Tokitokinomi converge. The plan was to entrust the Toatonomi to Toki, who we know is from the void century, who would then leap forward in time to the one of 800 years in the future when Joy Boy is supposed to make his second coming and deliver the fruit to the mink who becomes Twilight. That way the fruit would be unobtainable for 800 years since it wouldn't physically exist during that time. Since Zunisha ate the fruit, Zunisha is then ordered, likely with the awakened power of Thomas Fruit, to wander the earth, constantly moving to minimize his chances of being tracked by the government, unless ordered otherwise by Toki or one of her descendants. Why Toki and not a Kozuki? Because we know Odin cannot talk back to Zunisha, yet Toki was suspiciously left in Wano right before the Roger Pirates went to Zo, meaning we never got an interaction between her and Zunisha. With Zunisha eating the Toa autonomy, Toki's mission gets changed to go into the Wano of 800 years in the future, where Zunisha is supposed to come for Joy Boy's reappearance and liberate Sunisha from his curse, finally allowing him to die, just like the Wandering Jew is only allowed to die with the second coming of Christ. This is why Toki desperately needed to get to Wano, and why she no longer felt the need to leap forward 20 years to the future after she had her children with Odin, because now she had descendants who could carry on the mission for her. 
This is why it is said that Momonosuke is the one who will lead the world to its dawn, which is foreshadowed way back in Zou when Momonosuke brings the ruler of day and ruler of night together. He can bring night and day together because he has the birthright authority to command it. Yamato knows that Momo is the one to bring the dawn because he can talk to Zunisha. Once Momonosuke orders Zunisha to seize his wandering, Zunisha will finally be able to die. The Toatonomi will reincarnate in a fruit in the well tree, completing the peril to the Fountain of Youth, and Mink will eat it, becoming Twilight, and thus the dawn of the world is set in motion. Remember from Chapter 8, Sunisha, the well tree, and Carrot. In the cover of Chapter 846, Oda drew Luffy and Chopper surrounded by rabbits, and weirdly he put, very prominently, the number 39 in it. Chapter 39 is named For Whom the Bell Tolls, and when Carrot goes so long for the first time, we see very prominently also the number 05. Volume 5 is For Whom the Bell Tolls. The ringing of a bell symbolizes two things in One Piece. As per Buddhist tradition, the bell is rung to mark the beginning of a new age. We see this when Luffy rings the bell in the Saipia as he ushers a new age onto it, and when he rings the bell in Marineford, marking a new age for the world, as told to us by Kid and Killer, and the bell is also rung to honor the dead in funerary rites, like the Saipia bell was originally rung to guide the souls of the dead. We know that there is a bell in Zo. As Zunisha dies, the fruit responds, and Carrot eats it, the bell will ring. It tolls for Carrot, because she marks the beginning of a new age, and it tolls for Zunisha, because it's his funeral. And isn't it fitting for the fruit that will set in motion the coming of the dawn, a new age for the world, to have been with Zunisha this whole time? Because Zunisha was named after Ganisha, the Hindu god of new beginnings. So maybe you've heard of Japanese YouTuber Yudaron's theories on emo. I'm bringing this up because you will see a lot of stuff here will line up with Yudron's theory. In short, according to Yudron, Imu is inspired by the Moon Princess Kaguya from the Tale of the Bamboo Cutter, is a third-eyed woman, possibly with clairvoyance, is immortal, has a power to control water, is tied to the number 16 due to the wordplay of her name, Imu, and has some ties to snow. Now a scared will also be mortal and have the same eyes as Emu, we should expect some parallels between them. And sure enough, Carrot is the moon rabbit from Japanese folklore, frequently associated with Kaguya in popular depictions. She's the lookout and has great eyesight, ties to the third eye theory and potentially to clairvoyance, watches the oceans from the highest point in the sunny like Emu watches the world from the highest point in the red line, and is a snow rabbit. Lastly, Imu is based on Buddha, the characters from Imu combining into the kanji for Buddha, which is funnily also the kanji for France, and Imu coincidentally lives in a palace inspired by the Chateau de Chambord in France. And here's the most important connection, because the moon rabbit is a bodhisattva, someone who's in the path towards Buddhahood. And now you're probably thinking, wait, so Carrot is based on Alice and the rabbit from Alice in Wonderland, the Sunny, the Moon Rabbit, Sailor Moon, Eos, Hermes, and also Buddha? Are you actually on cocaine right now? To which I respond, I do not possess the financial means for that. Please subscribe. So remember how the minks have different uniforms for those who serve the ruler of the day and those who serve the ruler of the night? Well, if Carrot becomes a twilight, it doesn't make sense for her to wear either the colors of day or of night, but instead a cape of a third color, which would be, well, RGB people, it would be red. And oh gee, would you look at that. Not only is she an even more on the nose reference to Eos now, it's a clear reference to Tibetan Buddhist monks, such as the most important figure in modern Buddhism, the Dalai Lama. In fact, here's how Oda came up with the mink uniforms. He needed capes of three different colors. The one for twilight must be red because of Buddhism, and the other ones, blue for the day and green for the night, so that Carrot starts wearing a green cape, making her look like a carrot. So you don't think anything else of her saffron clothing until she switches to a red cape and the symbolism hits you like a bag of bricks. All the straw hats are assigned real life countries that they would be from. Carrot would be Nepalese, not only because Zunisha is tall as hell, but because Garchu comes from the Nepali Timilai Mai Garchu, meaning I love you. In the Shakya Republic, present day Nepal, is where Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha and founder of Buddhism, was born. Specifically, he was born in the town of Lumbini. In Lumbini, there are two main landmarks. The Bodhi tree, representing the tree Siddhartha meditated under until he achieved Nirvana, enlightenment, the real one being this one in Bodh Gaya, India, and the pillar of Ashoka, carved with a message in the ancient Brahmi script. 
you see a sacred tree and a stone carved with an ancient script. Other than the Bodhi tree, important symbols of the Gautama Buddha are the empty throne, symbolizing the throne Siddhartha sat on as he meditated under the tree. Don't need to tell you where to see that in One Piece, do I? And the elephant. Legend saying that Siddhartha's mother saw a white elephant enter her womb, becoming Siddhartha. Siddhartha being said to have reincarnated from an elephant. So you see the symbolism of Zunisha dying and then his power reincarnating into carrot? Reincarnating by carrot eating the fruit under the whale tree, like Siddhartha achieved enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. But why does eating the fruit symbolize achieving Nirvana? Because in Buddhism, Nirvana is the way to escape samsara, the endless cycle of reincarnation. Someone who is immortal is outside of the cycle of reincarnation. But the elephant is actually not the main animal that symbolizes the Gautama Buddha. That would be the snow lion. The snow lion is said to personify primordial playfulness. Paradoxically, the snow lion does not fly, yet his feet never touch the ground, continuously leaping from mountain peak to mountain peak. Isn't it interesting that in the chapter named Lion, in the volume named Lion, the playful carrot turns into a snow white moon lion and proceeds to fly while not really flying, more leaping midair. And I say the number 8 is tied to carrot because of infinity, but it's important to Buddhism too because of the Noble Eightfold Path, the path towards Nirvana, usually shown around the eight-spoke Dharma wheel, the most prominent and important symbol of Buddhism. And if you look in chapter 888, oh gee, would you look at that. Yes, that's how in our faces this has been this whole time. And it doesn't stop there. Last video, I talked about how all of the straw hats correspond to a god of the Olympus, Carrot being Hermes whose Roman version is Mercury. This is yet another connection with Sanji, because Sanji corresponds to Aphrodite, Venus, and Venus and Mercury are the two morning stars, the planets closest to the sun, only visible in the sky during twilight. Buddha was originally, with slightly different spelling in Sanskrit, the name for the planet Mercury, and the deity who personified it, who was the child of the moon, Chandra. But how are Imo and Kerat both Buddha? In the 16th chapter of the Lotus Sutra, Buddha reveals that he achieved enlightenment in the inconceivably remote past. This is the basis for the concept of the Eternal Buddha, contrasting with the Gautama Buddha. Imu is the Eternal Buddha, the one who achieved enlightenment in an incredibly remote past, while Karat is Siddhartha Gautama, the founder of Buddhism, the one who achieves enlightenment by meditating under the Bodhi tree. So Karat is the one who achieved enlightenment. Oh yes, and actually, it makes perfect sense. Remember how Luffy was when he lost Ace? Well, in Whole Cake Island, we see Carrot go through a similar situation with Pedro's death, who, for all we know, seemed like the most important person in her life. But look how differently she deals with the trauma. She does not get mad at Nami for holding her back. She does not get mad at Luffy for saying they have to leave. For Luffy to come back to himself, Jinbei had to physically subdue him before he would even listen. But when Jinbei says it's not the time to mourn Pedro's death and dispenses his wisdom, as he usually does, this golden, beautiful man, Carrot does not get mad at Jinbei. In fact, Brook is the one who lashes out at him. Carrot pays close attention to what Jinbei says, immediately understands the wisdom in it, wipes her tears away, and goes right back to her role on the ship. In the same night, when the crew find themselves in an impossible situation, she puts a smile on her face to reassure the crew and goes to fight in Pedro's stead. Despite the extreme recency of her trauma, she is quickly able to form a positive outlook on it. When they are leaving Total Land, Kert worries Sanji is blaming himself for Pedro's death, which she briefly was. She is empathetic and perceiving to the point of noticing Sanji's feelings, and even though she is the one suffering the most, she puts a smile on her face and comforts him. And though she is the one who ends up being comforted, her words are true and clearly they helped Sanji. Over and over, Carrot displays a level of emotional maturity and you could even say wisdom that's baffling for someone her age. And I'm not the only one surprised by how she deals with grief. The fact that she smiled and shed no tears during Pedro's funeral led to a revival in the community of the theories that she was the traitor, because of course this fandom just has to have the most negative interpretation of events when it comes to this character. No, she is not smiling because she does not care, her expression is bittersweet. Despite the grief, she can keep moving forward, as Pedro wanted. And now her character arc is precisely understanding that her true purpose is not revenge, but something that will change the entire world. It's an arc about finding true purpose, growing in wisdom, and can very well lead to some form of enlightenment. 
Now there are two main reasons why I think this aspect of her character goes unnoticed by the fandom. First one is, let's be real, because furry bad. But secondly, it's because her playful and childlike nature is not something most expect of someone wise. But this joyous and childish nature is actually a point in favor of her being someone in a path towards enlightenment. And to prove my point with you, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. When, when in aeroplane, sometimes this gas problem comes, <laughs> then you see, difficult to let out. <laughs> no? So occasionally, you see, look around, then, then you know, like that. <laughs> Characters in One Piece that have reached some form of enlightenment are the ones who maintain a joyous, laughing, and even somewhat childish spirit, even in the face of tragedy, and especially in the face of death. Kind of like this. There's a question of um, how you think about your own death. <laughs> that possibility. <laughs> Quite polite. Quite polite. <laughs> <laughs> So I mentioned in my last video how every straw hat corresponds to a sign of the Chinese zodiac, including the 13th sign, the cat. So with the help of this cover of chapter 651 that presents these correlations with some riddles, let's go through all of them. Luffy is the monkey, Zoro is the tiger, Nam is the cat, Sanji is the ram or sheep, Usopp, the only reptile, is the snake, also because snakes are seen as deceitful, Robin, the only bird, is the rooster. Rhino in Chinese is written like this, with this ideogram literally meaning bow. Also Frankie was assigned the bow as his animal resemblance back in SPS. The bow or ox is the one who carries others on his back in the tale of the great race that explains the order of the animals in the zodiac. Frankie is the bow because he built the sunny that carries the crew, he is the one who carries others on his back. Brooke was assigned the horse in the same SPS. I guess the joke here is that giraffes are the long horses. Jimbe, as I mentioned in my last video, is the boar or pig because of his tusks and also because Japanese boars are named Yama Kujira, meaning mountain goat. And Chopper, well, Chopper is frequently equated with the dog by fans because he's compared to a tanuki, a raccoon dog. The thing is, tanuki is raccoon dog only in English. There's no such association between the tanuki and dogs in Japanese. In fact, the the nucleus of Bake Danuki, the shape-shifting Tanuki Chopper is compared to, means leopard cat, and was used in Japan to identify straight cats. The dog is Yamato, she perfectly fits the role of the guardian dog. The hint of what Chopper is, is in the red panda. Pandas in Japanese are called Kumaneko, meaning bear cat, the red panda being Akai Kumaneko, red bear cat. So Chopper is the cat. Wait a moment. Um, so now we're going to get into the actually really weird part of this theory. It's time to address Gombe. The Chinese zodiac was brought to many different countries, but often with certain animals being replaced by others. Example, in Japan the boar replaces the pig and the ram replaces the ship. And this was a surprisingly big inspiration in One Piece. Let me give you an example. The dragon zodiac is described as a fierce leader and a bringer of rain, the hour of the dragon being defined as the hour dragons bring rain to the villages. We see this reference in One Piece with Monkey D. Dragon bringing a storm in his introduction and Kaido and Momo creating storms. In various Southeast Asian countries, the dragon is replaced by the naga, a serpent. In Turkey, the dragon is replaced by the crocodile. So remember in Alabasta when crocodile was controlling the rain and accusing cobra of controlling the rain? And then the arc finishes with Vivi bringing back the rain. This is why Vivi is the dragon, by the way, a fierce leader and a bringer of rain. Also, the Nefertaris are the ones who chose not to become celestial dragons, they are the dragons who stay down to earth. Now, in the Vietnamese and Gurong zodiacs, the rabbit is replaced by the cat. This is why we have Gombe and this weird thing with rabbits being cats, because cats and rabbits are interchangeable in the zodiac. So who's the rabbit? It's Chopper, because the hour of the rabbit is defined as the hour the jade rabbit pounds the herbal medicine. The rabbit is the one who pounds the medicine. Also, in the Malay zodiac, the rabbit is replaced by the mouse deer, a tiny deer like Chopper. So who's scared if not the rabbit? Karen is the rat. See, the position in the zodiac is not about how a character looks externally, but about the role they play in the story. This is not new, Zoro's animal resemblance is the shark, yet he's the tiger zodiac. Jimber is a whale shark, but the boar zodiac. 
So what's the role of the rat? The rat is the first sign of the zodiac as rats have a different number of digits on front and hind legs, thus traditionally making the rat a symbol of turnover or new start. The rat is the one who marks the beginning of a new age. The great race tells the rat to reach first place by hopping on the back of the bull with the cat and then pushing the cat into the water. In another version, the rat deceives the bull by saying he would sing for him. Those two tails mark the rat as a trickster. In a third version, the rat stows away on the dog's back. This marks the rat as a stowaway. Carrot is the rat because she's a trickster and a stowaway who as the twilight marks the beginning of a new age. So the rat zodiac in Japanese can be called Nezu or Nezumi. The numbers associated with these words in Japanese wordplay are 22 and 223. Chapter 22 is the Gaemon chapter. You know that one chapter we all think is there just as some weird foreshadowing to the whole series? Yeah, this is why it's the Island of Strange Animals. Because in One Piece the characters are all combinations of different animals. And in the cover what do we have? Luffy pounding mochi with the moon rabbits. What about chapter 223? Oh, no big deal, it's just the chapter Luffy meets Blackbeard. Not the only person Luffy meets, he also meets Bellamy and his first mate Sarquis. Funny thing about them, did you notice their bounties are just Luffy's and Blackbeard's birthdays reversed? Also, Luffy beats Bellamy like Blackbeard beats Sarquis. See, Bellamy represents the sun or day, and Sarquis represents the moon or night. A character with medium length blonde hair representing the sun and another with long silver hair representing the moon. Where else have we seen this? Also, Bellamy has a power that grants him immense jumping abilities, the Bane Bane no Mi. And remember how foreshadowing surrounding carrots often involves a big cat who's yellow with black spots? Bellamy the Hyena. Oh, and have you noticed how similar Gaemon and Blackbeard are? Because Gaemon is a standing for Blackbeard. See, the chapters with the rat zodiac, the one who marks the beginning of a new age, have standings for Carrot, the rat, and for Luffy and Blackbeard, the ones who can bring this new age, an age of light or an even greater darkness. Just like the twilight can be the twilight of dawn or the twilight of dusk. And here's the other parallel between Emu and Carrot. Emu is also the rat. See, there's a character named Nezumi, the corrupt marine that let Arlon continue his racist shenanigans in Kokoyashi village. We learned later in Fishman Island that Arlong was merely copying the racism and slavery the fishmen received from the Celestial Dragons. So if the Celestial Dragons are the large-scale version of Arlong, who is the large-scale version of Nezumi? It's Emu, the one above the Celestial Dragons who could stop them but doesn't. And Nezumi was the captain of the 16th branch in East Blue, a fact Oda made sure to tell us multiple times. But just like Zoro resembles a shark but plays the role of the tiger, Imu is the zodiac rat, but the animal Imu resembles the most is not the rat. Imu rules the oceans from above in the sky, only making a move to assassinate certain individuals. Like a fisher bird, rules the oceans from the sky. The animal Imu resembles is the crane, the animal that in East Asian mythology symbolizes immortality. Crane in Japanese is Tsuru. There are two characters named Tsuru in One Piece. Tsuru the Marine and Otsuru, Kinemon's wife. Now, where do you think Oda would hide foreshadowing for Emu in these characters? Well, other than Tsuru being an extremely strong old woman in the world government with powers related to water, I shit you not, he hid it in their heights and birthdays. From Otsuru's birthday, chapter 915, that's when we're introduced to Mouseman, the mouse gifter who defends Wano's class system. From her height, chapter 191 is the woman who controls the weather. Emu controls the weather with her water powers. In it, we see Miss Doublefinger. Doublefinger is a reference to the new year, the beginning of a new year, the red zodiac. In her belly, the eight spoke Dharma will. From Tsuru's birthday, chapter 326 is Iceberg Sun as we're introduced to Iceberg, the mayor of the city of water, like Emu is the ruler of the world's waters. We're also introduced to this little guy in his pocket, Tyrannosaurus, his pet rat. 
And finally, from our height, chapter 204 is called Red, in reference to Luffy using his blood as water to punch Crocodile. If blood is part water, then Imu should be able to control it. Controlling blood is likely to be a majorly important ability Imu has. And now we'll go back yet again to that color spread of chapter 692. Notice how there are various groups of three numbers laid along the image? Those are chapter numbers. 100 that has the reading Toad. The legend begins. We hear Roger's words about how some things cannot be stopped. Inherited will, a person's dreams, and the flow of time. Though Imu tries to keep the world at stasis, some things cannot be stopped. This chapter begins volume 12. The author's note says men will evolve to float in space a little. Moji appears with his ears elongated, looking like a white rabbit. 576. Whitebeard confirms it, the One Piece does exist. The One Piece is what will finally bring the dawn. 876. Pudding coincidentally appears. Whoa, the three-eyed woman who erases people's memories, what a coincidence. 124. In the cover, Sanji takes Express Tsuru with cranes. In his suitcase, the secret and the year 1830. The revolutions of 1830, such as the French July Revolution. And finally, 111. Secret Criminal Organization. It's revealed that Baroque works, the organization ruled from the shadows by Crocodile, as the world government is ruled from the shadows by Imu, was founded with the goal of creating an utopia. Imu created the world government originally with the goal of creating an utopia. But it didn't quite work out that way, and now Imu's rule is coming to an end. In chapter 1029, named Tawa, Tower, Hawkins draws the Tower card, symbolizing an upheaval in the established order. The Tower card shows the Tower being hit by lightning, just like Imu, who is tied to France, is shaped like the Eiffel Tower, and the Eiffel Tower is frequently hit by lightning. And just like we see Miss Doublefinger being hit by lightning in the chapter right after, she who controls the weather, and this is what her eye looks like immediately after. Imu's reign is coming to an end, because twilight has arrived marking the coming of the dawn because the new rat zodiac has arrived, closing the age of the previous one and beginning a new one, and because the new Buddha has arrived to replace the old. So if Carrot is gonna replace Imu as the world's Buddha, does that mean Carrot will become the world's ruler? No. Moving on. Now, is this whole thing with the Toa Tonami merely symbolic? Was it simply prophesied that a mink would inherit the fruit and accompany Joy Boy, marking the coming of the dawn? Or is there a more concrete reason why its time stopping abilities would be required to bring the dawn? So maybe you heard this already, it's been pointed out by the community for a long time, but generally when the symbol of a whale appears, the One Piece or Laugh Tale is mentioned. So it hardly seems like a coincidence to me that this fruit will reincarnate in a fruit from the whale tree. In the whale tree is where we find our first road poneglyph, and where we learned how to get to Laugh Tale even. Does the Toa Tonomi have some kind of connection to the One Piece? Remember what is the safest way to keep something from falling in the wrong hands for hundreds of years? Send it forward to the future with the power of the Toki Toki no Mi. That way it would be inaccessible to anyone during that time leap, as it physically wouldn't exist during that time. But what if something is sent to an unexplicably distant future, to millions, billions of years in the future, to an infinitely distant future even? It would be as if it ceased existing, it would be constantly blitzing to the future, never arriving at any particular time, becoming forever unobtainable by anyone in the world. Except if you have the Toa Tonomi. An user of the Toa Tonomi could potentially negate the power of the Toki Tokonomi using its power stasis of stopping time at the location the object was sent to the future to stop its forward blitzing time, forcibly making it arrive in the present. So, as my final bit of speculation for this video, I'll say that at Laftail, something was sent to an unexplicably distant future with the power of the Toki Tokinomi, and now can only be obtained with the Toa Tonomi. That something is required to get the One Piece, or might even be the One Piece itself. So, there are two videos that can naturally follow from this one. 
Firstly, one delving deeper into Imo and Buddhism, answering what it means to be Buddha in the One Piece world, how Carrot would perform this role differently than Imu, why Imu created the world government the way it is, what are Imu's current intentions, what is the will of D, and what is the dawn of the world. Secondly, one unveiling Carrot's secret backstory, because no, I don't believe for a second that we got Carrot's tragic backstory in real time, only the very tail end of it. And her real backstory will be, mark my words, the craziest one in One Piece thus far. And for this, we'll also be unveiling Kaido's fourth calamity. Who they are, where they are, how they will return to the story, and why Kaido could not be Joy Boy. The second one is more pertinent to the current story, so I'll get to that one first. Don't forget to rate the video and subscribe. And don't worry, I won't litter your front page, I only post a video every month or something. For this one, that's all. Ciao.